Constellation Energy specifically and power companies more generally have been closely tied to the AI data center trade over the past year or so. And that's because those data centers, of course, need a lot of power. What's next for the power trade? Joe Dominguez is joining us now. He's CEO of Constellation Energy, and he's joining us from Houston, where the Sarah Week big energy conference is going on. Joe, thanks so much for being with us. Julie, my pleasure. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I want to start with this sort of cadence of incoming interest that you're getting from the data center operators. We know that these companies are spending a lot of money this year on building out these centers. We know that they want power for those centers. So I'm just curious, uh, over the past year from then to now, kind of the cadence of how things have changed, if they've changed, and what kind of incoming interest you're getting. The, uh, the pace of actual deals is about the same as it was last year. The, uh, the kind of frenzied interest has settled down. I think, the, I think all the clients in this space, the hyperscalers, the data center developers, are all starting to figure out the energy business and, uh, and are a little bit more rational in terms of how they're approaching. And, and by that I mean they're not like going to 20 different places to investigate the possibility of interconnecting the same data center. I think they're more targeted now and the conversations I, I, I think have uh, kind of rationalized a bit. Is there a particular power source that you're finding they're most interested in? Of course, you guys signed that uh, deal with Microsoft to restart one of the reactors, the nuclear reactors at Three Mile Island and nuclear has been a big buzzword, but are they sort of agnostic as long as they're getting an adequate, steady supply of power? I don't think they're agnostic at all. They hmm. want clean and reliable power. In fact, uh, a number of these uh, customers have doubled down. And I'm talking about the hyperscalers in particular. They've doubled down on their climate-related goals and, and, uh, and their desire to hit that. I think as you, you move away from the hyperscalers and you just talk about data center developers, and there are a number of big ones, but from big to small, then I think the focus on the clean part of it is uh, less important to them. Uh, but clean and reliable in terms of the big plays are the two things they want. And the only place you could get that really is with nuclear in most parts of the country. So that's why the focus on nuclear. And I want to ask a little bit more about that because that Microsoft deal I mentioned so far, uh, that deal got a lot of attention obviously when it was signed, but so far it's really the first and so far only deal of its kind. And so I'm curious if you are in discussions on more like that and if you think more will follow either from Constellation or in the industry more broadly. Yeah, we are in more discussions and I'm confident more will follow. Um, there has been another deal announced. Of course, uh, Amazon and Talon announced a deal at the Susquehanna facility. So uh, there's a couple out there. There are more deals that have been announced in terms of building new nuclear and kind of joint development work that companies are doing with hyperscalers. So look, I, 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 think, the, the, I think more deals will come. I think the folks have to understand that we are talking about deals that dimensionally could run 20 years could involve five or $10 billion in nominal value. Those things don't get done overnight. And so uh, uh, you could be in negotiations for literally five or six months, even after you've negotiated the financial aspects of the deal, just working through the T's and C's. Um, and I'm also wondering about the regulation of all of it, because uh, there's been a lot of talk by this administration about deregulation across a lot of different industries, right? Um, one of the most regulated industries is sure. nuclear, with good, good reason, one would think. Um, so what do you think does need to change on the regulatory front for nuclear specifically um, when it comes to going forward and sort of the, the increased demand that we're seeing? Yeah, look, I think one of the things that uh, has slowed the process up a bit is we need to have some clarity in terms of the co-location of nuclear uh, and data centers, as an example, or any power plants and data centers, uh, so that they could operate together. And the reason you want these things close together is you have a customer that has a big demand, and of course you have the power plant right next door. That limits the amount of transmission that you have to build and substation work that you have to build. So. 
The data centers want to come close to the plants as a general rule when they, when they need this much power. And so there needs to be rules of the road for how to interconnect those. I think the focus of the administration on speeding that process is something that's resonating through all regulatory agencies at, at this point. No one misunderstands how important this technology is, not only for American business, but for our national security as well. So they want to get the rules done, but these are big, complicated things. And I think people have a, an expectation that they get done overnight. And as you know, in any kind of regulatory process, even one that's moving quickly, you could spend three to six months just ironing, ironing out the details among the many stakeholders. And that's what we're seeing. But we're seeing a lot of activity that's positive and we think will lead to some clarity that will actually be pro-deal. Um, as we know, of course, also the Department of Government Efficiency Doge uh, has been cutting a lot of folks. Are, are, do you have any concerns in terms of regulation, whether that is going to slow any needed regulatory change that, that needs to get through for the industry? I have no, um, no sense that that's going to have an impact at this point in time. I guess it might, uh, but the agencies that we're talking about are independent Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We're not talking about tens of thousands of people that work there. They're relatively small. Uh, in terms of other, uh, other agencies or departments in the U.S. government, and I think the impact's going to be minimal. And you guys also supply um, nuclear power to the federal government. I believe you all just signed some new contracts to do so, a billion dollars worth of contracts. Um, how is that power going to be deployed? Talk to me about the role that Constellation is playing there. Well, what we're doing is providing 24-7 reliable energy to government agencies, and as you noted, we we signed a deal uh, that was north of a billion dollars when we announced it at the beginning of the year. So the federal government under many administrations is just looking for price certainty over, uh, you know, over the course of years and is looking for a reliable resource like nuclear that could provide 24-7 clean energy. Um, finally, I want to. We've been talking all about nuclear, but I do want to ask about natural gas as well. Um, the prices have been sure. rising to some extent once again. So, how does Constellation sort of manage for that? And when you think about the power generation mix um, from Constellation, what do you think is the sort of ideal mix given the the cost landscape right now? Well, look, we serve about seventy five percent of the Fortune one hundred commercial and industrial customers. And I could tell you that it is rarely the case that any customer uses only one fuel type over the course of many years. Yes, we've done more with clean energy, whether it be nuclear, geothermal, or renewables with these customers, but there, it's, it takes a comprehensive portfolio of resources that match up to the customer's locations each and every place they might do business, right? So you need resources that do a great many things. Nuclear is great for baseload energy, but for peaking, gas becomes really important. So we announced earlier this year the acquisition of Calpine which is the nation's largest natural gas company. So we will have under one roof, so to speak, post uh, close of the transaction, which we expect later this year, the largest nuclear fleet, largest natural gas fleet, largest geothermal fleet, a leading provider of storage and customer solutions. So you see where we're trying to go with this. We're trying to be the low and zero uh, emission resource that is also very reliable. We want to put that under one roof so that we could provide customers unprecedented duration and price certainty, and that becomes really important. Look, if you're spending tens of billions of dollars on a data center, the last thing you want to worry about is what natural gas prices were uh, yesterday or what they're going to be a month from now. You want price certainty because you want to solve for that variable. There are enough other variables in the business, as we all know. So that allows Constellation to play in that space. And for any particular customer, we could blend those resources in a way that meet their sustainability goals, but most importantly, their price certainty and reliability goals. That's what we're trying to do here at Constellation. I think we're going to be able to do that next year. Joe, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you. Thanks for your time this morning. So it's an interesting backdrop for the conference, right? We saw oil settle, WTI that is settled today, below $66 a barrel. There do seem to be a lot of growth concerns out there. So I'm curious what you're hearing from your members and what you're hearing on the ground there at the conference about some of these growth concerns. Well, one of the key themes that is emerging at this year's conference is truly that we're going to need a lot more energy, uh, particularly to feed the AI and data center boom that we know exists and that's going to continue to grow. So one of the themes that we continue to hear from our members is we need a lot more energy going forward. And what that means is that we're going to need a lot more oil and gas in particular. So uh, I think the growth story is going to be enormous uh, for the oil and gas industry going forward. You know, when it comes to more oil specifically, as we well know, the administration and, and President Trump's mantra of drill, baby, drill that he has repeated here, how willing are your members, though, to increase production when we've got oil prices that continue to fall here? Our industry is poised to uh, grow uh, significantly this year. In fact, uh, based on, on just what we're hearing from the, our membership, we expect about $200 billion in investment in the United States just this year alone. Uh, the world is going to require $600 billion of investment just to keep oil production at its current rate. Uh, so we expect uh, continued growth here in the United States. Uh, we reflect on, on some of the numbers that we've seen out of the Dallas Fed that says that 57% of oil executives uh, expect growth uh, uh, this year. Uh, so we expect continued growth in these markets, uh, particularly on the natural gas side uh, as well, which we're going to need a lot more of if uh, we're going to uh, supply the needs of the world, an energy-hungry world that continues to grow. Right. Definitely natural gas playing an important part. Oil specifically, though, we're at just about at record production here in the U.S. Are we going to see an increase in oil production specifically this year? We are close to 13.5 million barrels of production a day. That is record levels. Uh, and I expect that, uh, you know, based on the independent analysts that we've seen, the Energy uh, Information Agency at the Department of Energy actually expects that we're going to grow that uh, by the end of the decade to almost 15 million barrels a day. And that's good for the United States. That's good for American consumers. But it's also good for our world partners as well, uh, because we know that that growth is only going to go up. Uh, the world consumes about 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Uh, that number is going up, not down. And that means more investment here in the United States and across the world. Um, I, I, th I think if I heard you correctly on those numbers, that is still less than a 3 million barrel a day increase, which is what the Treasury Secretary, Scott Besant, is aiming for when we're talking about the increase in oil production. Um, do you think, you know, is that achievable to get three more million more barrels a day out of uh, the United States? Look, there are two things that are going to drive increased production in the United States. One is supply and demand. Uh, and our members are going to continue to step up to meet the demands of the American people uh, at the right price. But the second thing that we have more control over and that this administration has more control over is the regulatory environment. We saw a regulatory barrage under the Biden administration. We're just now recovering from that. Uh, and we expect a much more favorable regulatory environment from the Trump administration. Joining us now to look under the hood on energy changes amid the AI boom, we've got Nextera CEO John Ketchum joining us from the conference. John, thank you so much for being here. I should point out, by the way, amidst this big sell-off today, some of the utilities are catching a bid, Nextera among them. I just checked your shares up about 3% uh, right now. Um, but you guys have also seen your stock increase this year. You said today at the conference you expect power demand to surge by 55% over the next 20 years, which is a huge increase. And you talked about needing all types of power uh, generation to get there. So I guess I would ask, first of all, are we going to be able to meet that increase in demand and how? We are, and it's like you said, it's going to take all forms of energy in order to get there. And a company like Nextera, we're in all forms of energy. We are the leading gas fire generator in the United States. We're the seventh largest nuclear developer uh, and operator in the world. We're the world's leader uh, in renewables, and we are prepared to deliver all types of generation sources 
uh, to our customers. But it's going to take all forms of energy to meet that demand. We've never seen demand like this in our in, in our industry, in our history. And to think about six-fold increase over the next 20 years, that's substantial. It is substantial. I would ask then, not only in terms of power generation, but is the grid going to be able to deliver the power that the industry is able to generate? I mean, what kind of updates are going to be needed there? It is. We've got to be really smart about where we locate and where we site new generation alternatives. And that's one thing that our company is very used to doing. We are a data science oriented organization that delivers electricity. We've designed a product called TerraGrid that helps us identify for our customers where the best and lowest cost points are to interconnect into the grid and where the most efficient transmission solutions can come into play in order to free up additional generation options for our customers. I want to ask you about other sources of energy as well, because Energy Secretary uh, Chris Wright was there, is there at the, at the conference, and today he said that the U.S. is going to execute a 180-degree pivot on energy policy. He said, quote, that will include a truly honest assessment of climate change. Um, this new administration, what effect is this going to have on solar and wind energy policy in particular, which you guys also generate? Yeah, we are going to need all the above generation sources, as I, as I said at the top. And it's going to require wind, solar, battery storage, gas fire generation, and nuclear fire generation as well. But there's a difference in terms of the timing that those different sources can be brought to market and the cost associated with those alternatives as well. And let me give you an example. Gas fire generation, nobody's built more gas fire generation in this country in the last 20 years than next era energy. But we know how long it takes to build and how much it costs. And what's happening is that there's been a huge increase in the demand for gas fire generation, which has really pushed the cost up of gas turbines and the availability of gas turbines and the labor required to build them. So if you think about the labor sources that are required to build complex infrastructure like a gas-fired generation facility, we're competing with data centers, with, hyper, with uh, semiconductor chip manufacturing, with the electrification of industry, with LNG terminals, with oil and gas refineries. And when you combine that shortage of turbines together with the higher cost to build because of labor inflation, gas fire generation is now three times more expensive than it was just 18 or 24 months ago. We see that in our own fleet. Our last gas fire plant was taken commercial in 2022 at 785 a kW. That same plant today costs 2400 a kW. So, and it comes in later, 2030, 2030 or beyond, and the nuclear is 2035 or beyond that. So we're going to need renewables really to bridge ourselves to a point where we can get the 2030, where we can offer all of the above, renewables, 